this is to be a class which we are calling an advanced class. This carries with it greater responsibilities than would ordinarily be because it assumes that there are certain things that you know now that would not be mentioned in a closed class where there were many students who perhaps had not yet had experience with healing work. For instance, by now, you know that there is no God in heaven or on earth within you or without you that is concerning itself very much about this human picture. That might be a very startling statement to make to a very young student, one who has not yet awakened from their orthodox dream or from the paganistic gods of the church and still believes there is some kind of a fanciful figure in heaven or on earth, within you or without you, that is going to do something about these errors of the earth or these discords of your particular being. This work assumes that you have already experienced the fact that God is of too pure eyes to behold iniquity and therefore God knows nothing of any world in which there is any sin, disease, death, lack, or limitation. This work also assumes that you know that you bring the kingdom of God into your experience proportionately to your own effort. In other words, <clears throat> there is something that you have to do. The responsibility is on your shoulders to bring the life of grace into your experience. By now you must have learned that you cannot sit, a, sit around waiting for a God, hoping for a God. The effort must be your effort and mine because it's a continuing experience. We never reach the end. We never reach a place where we can let go and say, oh, now that's done. Oh, no. Ours is a continuing effort. And seemingly, the further along the path we go, the greater the effort has to be to live and move and have our being consciously one with God. The truth that you know, that you embody, that you consciously bring to your remembrance day by day, hour by hour, minute by minute, the praying without ceasing, 
the abiding in the Word and letting the Word abide in you, the dwelling in the secret place of the Most High, keeping uh, the mind stayed on God. The more active you are in these things, the more of the God experience you have. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. How often shall ye know the truth, and how many days, weeks, months, years? Pray without ceasing. Dwell in the secret place of the Most High. It is a life work, in other words. God is spirit. And the kingdom of God is closer to you than breathing and nearer than hands and feet. But it is you who must open out a way for the imprisoned splendor to escape. It is you who have to consciously bring forth this kingdom of God from within you. When you ask a practitioner for help, that practitioner has no more power to give you the help of themselves than you have to give it to yourself. Therefore, the practitioner, by virtue of the fact that they are to a great extent living in the spiritual consciousness, nevertheless, when you ask for help, they must still have their periods of inner quiet and peace and wait for that imprisoned splendor to come forth, wait for that click to come, announcing that conscious oneness with God has been established. <clears throat> Therefore, I would like to start out by saying to you that just as we have meditated at the start of this class, do not think for a moment that that is all of the meditation that has taken place for this class because ever since I knew that a class was to take place, I have had daily and nightly periods of meditation for this class and its students. And today I have been meditating ever since I awakened early this morning all throughout this day, stopping only for brief periods of eating, reading, talking, then back into the meditation again. Why? Why? Is not God the teacher of this class? Is not God the teacher within you? Yes, those are beautiful words. But to bring it into practical demonstration, it is necessary that the teacher be so completely a vacuum personally as to make way for the imprisoned splendor, the voice, the still small voice of the teacher to come through. In the same way, you will find from this class onwards that more will be demanded of you in the way of periods of meditation, because more is going to be demanded of you from your world, more of demonstration for yourself as well as for others. and. Uh, since you of yourself have no way of helping yourself or others, you too will have to have all of the hours, days, nights, weeks necessary to bring through from within this divine harmony. Your life will have to be even more of a praying without ceasing than it ever was before unless you want to miss the opportunity of whatever this class may mean. But if this class is to be a progressive step 
one that you can look back on and say, ah, yes, I made certain amount of progress up to that step, but then I doubled my progress after that step, then uh, that will mean that you are devoting much more time and effort to reading, to hearing, to meditating. Now, <clears throat> we have three languages in our lives, each one of us, We have the milk of the word, which is for babes. And that is the language we use when we are talking to those who come to us for help in their earliest stages. And then there is the metaphysical language that we use when students are further along the path and we're talking to them in terms of the letter of truth. And then there are the new tongues spoken of in Scripture, the new tongue, the spiritual language, that which must sound like double talk to the outside world. In uh, the pamphlet, The Secret of the 23rd Psalm, you have an example of two of these languages. For that pamphlet is both the milk of the word and uh, the new tongue. It is both the simplest unfoldment of the infinite way and the highest, both in that one pamphlet. How does that come about? Well, it wasn't done by, on purpose. It came through that way. When uh, an orthodox person, a person of orthodox religion, reads that pamphlet, the reaction upon them must be, why, that's exactly what we've always been taught. Why, I knew that from, from my Sunday school days. And that's the way it reads, too, just exactly as anybody in any church could agree on. And it is well that they interpret it that way because it gives them the ability to relax. But on the other hand, if you read that pamphlet in the light of what you know, you will find that it is saying, there is no Lord to lead me into green pastures or beside the still waters for there is only an is. Harmony is. Peace is. All already is. You read into it that we are always beside the still waters and green pastures, for the Lord is my shepherd, therefore I have never wandered out of them. I have never wanted and can never want you will read into it that we do not even need a God to bring anything to us, for the nature of God is such that that which we are seeking is already established within our own being. Just read that pamphlet again and see how you can get the old-fashioned idea that there is a God somewhere going to lead me into green pastures and by the still waters. And reading more deeply, realize that because the Lord is my shepherd, I do not need any God to lead me anywhere, for I am already there. So it is that in the earliest experiences of metaphysics, we really believe that there is a God that heals diseases. We really believe that there is a God that sends us supply. By now we have come to see this. 
that when we are in the realm of God, there aren't any diseases. When we are in the realm of God, there isn't any lack or limitation or unhappiness or sin or sinful desires. Therefore, you begin to perceive that God doesn't operate in the human world, but being in the presence of God dissolves the human world. Oh, you, you now have an entirely different idea of the nature of God. Now you begin to perceive that the only reason we ever experience sin, disease, death, lack, limitation, remember God hath no pleasure in your dying, therefore you couldn't even die at 110, unless for some reason you were slipping outside the realm of God, for in the, the kingdom of God there is no death. God is immortality itself. God is life eternal, and to know God aright is to demonstrate life eternal. You cannot die, you cannot go anywhere, you cannot lose consciousness. None of those things can happen in the presence of God. If they happen, they happen outside of the orbit of God when for some reason you have separated yourself from the realization of God's presence. I know that a question comes up there. The question is, how, if God is all, is it ever possible to become separated from God? And I don't know the answer to that, because that has to do with two experiences that are recorded in Scripture. One is the Adam experience in which Adam and Eve were thrown out of the Garden of Eden. In other words, up to that moment, they were living in this very harmony of which I'm speaking. They had never been born, and they could never die. They could never know lack or limitation, unhappiness, or any other form of discord. But in some way, and I don't have the answer to this, as to how it happened, I can tell you what happened that caused them to be thrown out of the Garden of Eden. They accepted the belief of good and evil, of two powers. And in that, they lost their heritage. They lost their spiritual home, their spiritual consciousness and they became human beings. And all of their descendants right down to us have since been born as human beings, separate and apart from Eden, separate and apart from the kingdom of God. Why? Because from that day unto this, the belief of good and evil predominates in human consciousness. And even those of us who are somewhere along on the spiritual path in some ways are still dominated by this universal belief in two powers, the power of good and the power of evil. The other scriptural experience is that of the prodigal son, who up to a certain moment was joint heir to his rich father, to the rich kingdom, had everything. By the grace of his father, he had everything. And then for some unknown reason, we know that it happened, but we do not know why it happened. He had a desire to be something of himself. He grew weary of just living on his father's wealth, his father's estate, through his father's consciousness, and he wanted to be something of himself, and so he left his father's house. And he became a separate selfhood. 
completely dependent on himself and his self was so great that you know he ended up banqueting with the swine only when he realized that separate and apart from his father he was nothing only in that realization was he led back to the father's house and there he was reinvested with the robe and the ring of divine sonship so it is we as humans have developed the worry habit because we have cut ourselves off from the Father and uh, we have accepted the universal belief that we have to earn a living we have to maintain our health we have to be responsible for this that or the other thing and uh, as you so well know the mass of humanity awakens in the morning and uh, either lies in bed waiting to be thrown out or else jumps out and makes its preparations for the day and gulps its breakfast and then out into the business world or somewhere else and probably from Monday morning to Sunday the name God doesn't enter thought or less than a swear word or something or in a vain or vague hope but the serious thought of God just doesn't enter the average human uh, world and perhaps it does on Sunday if it's accustomed to going to church and if not and it turns the radio on it's bound to hear it because there's so much of it there on Sunday and so it seems that the world is made conscious of God at least one day a week in some measure but actually the human world is not living on God consciousness as a matter of fact it doesn't even want to be dependent on God because that takes away its own pride in itself it would seem as if it were leaning it would seem as if it were not self-sufficient and uh, so it becomes unfashionable really to be dependent on God at any rate these are the two scriptural stories that illustrate how it is that we now are taking that long hike back to the father's house or else we are slowly but surely teaching ourselves that there is but one power and God is that power and it is neither good nor evil it is just infinite God perfection now all the way up through your studies and practice of the message of the infinite way you have certain principles which constitute what we call the correct letter of truth that is we understand first of all that you are not going to make spiritual progress without coming to some measure of realization of the nature of God not the God that's presented in the churches or in literature but the one true God which no man or woman can reveal to you but which you by a constant turning within can have revealed to you in that sense you see God is your teacher only God can teach you really and truly the name and the nature and the character of God the work that we do is to send you back and show you how to go back to the kingdom within yourself there to be taught in giving you the correct letter of truth it enables you to go back within and be taught in other words 
if you start with the master's revelation that the kingdom of God is within you and then uh, accepting this you develop for yourself the practice of going within yourself for that revelation for that teaching you will find eventually that you will be taught of God you will receive just as much illumination instruction impartation wisdom from within you as anybody has ever received at any time in the world because God is no respecter of persons therefore the kingdom is within you each one of you therefore it is available to you but only in proportion to the measure of your searching and seeking it is not to be lightly found the way is straight and narrow and few there be that enter because we have behind us hundreds of generations of those who have started us out at babies with as babies with rattles to play with instead of teaching us to sit there and ponder God right from our birth and when we outgrew rattles they gave us dolls and soldiers and marbles instead of giving us spiritual wisdom to eat and drink and play with and the very moment we outgrew those toys they handed us boys and girls to play with they never have stopped giving us something in the external realm business money anything to blind us to the fact that the life that we should be living is uh, the life within and so it is that it's very difficult now to learn to meditate it's very difficult now to learn how to go within and be at peace until that still small voice does talk now our whole mind is taking up with how to earn a living how to get along with each other how to do this and how to do that and when we have time left over we're giving too many means of entertainment so that we are broken really of the habit of living within our own being at least enough hours of the day to be fed by the inner meat and inner wine and inner water now we're coming back to that and up to this point you have been practicing it you're practicing it when you're hearing this message and you're practicing it when you are reading this message and you are practicing it when you meditate upon this message but from here on now you have to go further than that deeper than that because now you cannot satisfy yourself with any such thing as it is difficult or I can't do it now you know that having come to this point you've got to do it you have got to do it you have got to come to the place of excelsior you've got to come to the place where nothing is going to daunt you and nothing is going to get in your way because if the Spirit of God has led you on to this point be assured of this it's going to push you from here on and if you don't listen and if you don't obey don't be surprised if you get pushed out of the way now <clears throat> from this point on in your experience there should be more people coming to you for help you should be opening your consciousness more in the willingness to be the light to those who come to you not seeking them out but remembering at every call never to say no and it is at this stage where it is necessary for you to be sure that you do know the correct letter of truth in all of its aspects so as not to give 
wrong answers to those who come to you. Remember now that there is a responsibility on your shoulder when anyone asks a question, you have to answer it correctly or not answer it at all. You cannot answer incorrectly, nor can you guess. You have to know these books so thoroughly that you know the answer. Or you have to know where to go in them to find it. Because it is a grave responsibility when someone comes to you with spiritual, for spiritual help, it is a grave responsibility to give it to them correctly because they are coming to be fed, spiritually fed, and you cannot give them a stone. It has been done. The Master spoke of that. And it is being done. Many go seeking spiritual food and receive stones. Don't do that because there's no excuse for your doing it. You have the correct letter. It is in the writings. I know now from 28 years with it that it is correct. And I see from the footage of it, it is correct. And so I can say to you, you have the correct message, but be sure that you know these books well enough to be able when students come to you for help that you can give them the correct letter. In other words, that when someone asks for help, that you can instantly assure them, remember there is only one power, this that you are asking help for isn't a power. The question came up just the other day with someone when we were discussing the subject of drink, someone who was drinking too heavily. And my answer was, be careful that you don't believe that alcohol is power. Now, at first, I know that that sounds shocking. We see the evidence of alcohol and alcoholism on every side. But if you were to accept the belief that alcohol is power, you would be the blind leading the blind. You would never help anyone overcome alcoholism, nor would you help anyone free their husband or son or father of alcoholism, unless you yourself had so clearly perceived the nature of this message that you knew there is only one power. Now, what is the difference between alcoholism or the germs of infection or contagion? What is the difference? If you are going to say they are of no power, you must be equally sure of that with alcohol or drugs of any nature. In other words, your stand from morning to night and night to morning must be there is but one power. I know all the appearances that are in the world. I know all of the claims to power that exist. But I say to you that if you are to be a person who lives the spiritual life and expects to see it brought forth in spiritual healing, you must come somewhere close to where Adam and Eve were before they were thrown out of the Garden of Eden when they too believed in one power, before they ate of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Do you see that? All of our discords have to do with our believing that we have a knowledge of good and evil. We know what things are good and what things are evil, but there are no things that are good and there are no things that are evil. God is the substance of all form. Therefore, there is no evil form in all this world, and no good form. There is only God form, no form that has opposites. What then that we behold with the eye, that represents the concepts which have been etched into our mind by the belief of good and evil, the knowledge of good and evil, when you can't have knowledge of good and evil because good and evil does not exist. 
nothing is good or bad, but thinking makes it so. Have you ever thought through that statement? Take that statement up in your meditation sometime and see how true it is that regardless of what it is that you have called good, somebody gave it the name good for some reason, but somewhere on earth there are those who do not call it good. Take up any form of evil that you know of in your whole experience and see if you can't trace around and find somewhere on earth where that very thing is not considered evil. Nothing is good or evil, but thinking makes it so. Accepting the knowledge of the tree of good and evil, that's what does it all. How do we know this to be true? Because when we sit back in treatment and start with that premise, now wait a minute, I can't fear this thing. for there is no power of evil in the world. I have a God. There is a God. Is there? There must be. There can be no effect without a cause, and there is a world, therefore there must be a cause of the world. So there is a God. There is. Well, if there is, it couldn't be God without infinity. Omnipotence, omniscience, omnipresence, then that means there can't be anything but God. That means there can't be two powers. There can only be one. Therefore, I do not have to fear what mortal mind can do to me or mortal man can do to me or mortal condition can do to me or mortal thing can do to me or to thee. And I work with that until I arrive at a place in consciousness where why certainly there are not two powers. When I've arrived at that place, I am back in the kingdom, I'm the Garden of Eden, and I have taken my patient there with me, and uh, the patient, too, eventually realizes why there is no disease. That was a dream. It's all gone. Where is it? Another time, I may take another facet of that same truth. You may present a problem uh, which has behind it some kind of a law, a law of heredity or law of infection or law of contagion or law of time, age. Anyhow, in connection with your call to me, you've roused in my thought a thought of law. And so I sit back in my meditation. Law, law. God is the only lawgiver. God is spirit. And God, then all law must be spirit spiritual, then how can there be a destructive law? How can there be a finite law? How can there be a law of limitation? Heavens above, there's only one law, and it's spiritual. There are no material laws, there are no legal laws. I wish you could know the work that is being done in prisons by those who know that there is no legal law, that legal law has no binding effect on anyone. The only law is the law of spirit. And the very minute that the spirit touches one of these boys or girls in prison, the whole legal law drops away. I have a man coming out of prison this week in the States who's only been there a few months, who was sent there for years for an offense. But this week he's being released. It's never happened before. Never happened for that offense, it never happened in that state, but it's happened to him. It doesn't happen so that he can be free to go out and do it again. It happens only because at the very start, when his mother asked for help, a transformation took place in him. When that spirit touched him, legal law was dead. You can't hold a spiritual being in prison. That's what he had become. He died to his humanhood. He was reborn of the spirit. And how can you hold that in prison? Do you see what I'm getting at? You don't condemn anyone for their sins. You don't judge them. And you don't hold them in bondage or punishment to them. But you begin to realize law, law, law. 
If God is one, law is one. If God is spirit, law is spiritual. Do you follow that? Another time, in another treatment, you may uh, oh, be told that your patient's going to die tonight or nothing can save them or this, that, or the other thing, and the thought of power comes into your mind. And you say, power to cause disease, power to cause death, power to perpetuate death, power to perpetuate disease, power, 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 until that word rings in you and you realize God is power. Oh, wait a minute. If God is power, can there be two powers? No, because you're right back again with infinity, aren't you? God must be infinite power in order to be God. Then there can't be two powers. Well, then what have I got to fear? I shall not fear what power can do to me. Do you see how necessary it is to know the correct letter of truth so that when you sit down to your treatment, you have available these truths, we call them, statements of truth, facets of truth, with which to refute the appearance. Now, it is not these statements of truth that bring about the healing. No, no, no. <clears throat> if they did, you'd never outgrow statements of truth, but you will outgrow them. No, these statements of truth are to enforce your own understanding and assurance so that you can come to a place of sitting relaxed and then wait for the spirit to announce itself. You can't do that while you're fearing for your patient. You can't do that while you're wondering what can help them or if you can reach God. You can only rest in inner peace after you have come to the realization that there are not powers of good and powers of evil there is only the power of God. You cannot rest in treatment to bring forth your treatment for your patient until you yourself have reached a consciousness in which there are not two powers operating or two laws operating or two substances operating. Do you see that? Your treatment does not become effective until you yourself have arrived at the place of oneness, one power, one law, one presence, one life, one being, one cause, one effect, now you can sit there and you can really wait for God's grace to be upon you, God's spirit to envelop you, God's release to come to you, then uh, your treatment is complete. Never forget, your treatment doesn't really start until you yourself have arrived at the place of inner peace through your realization uh, of one, whether it's one power, one person, one being, one cause, one law, one. When you've reached that, when you've come to that place in your own consciousness where you are now convinced, thank God there are not two powers. Now you can sit there and very soon the grace of God will be upon you. Now, it doesn't really, in the beginning years, it doesn't come that first time when you sit down. It doesn't always come you may find that you have to repeat that treatment for your patient an hour or two or three later. Or you may have to repeat it that night or in the middle of the night or the next morning. You may have to repeat it days and days. Because there we are again. As human beings, we are living this life of separation. And it isn't always easy just at the moment we want to go back and get at one with God to be there. And so it is that it may be necessary to repeat this treatment many times until <clears throat> the uh, click finally comes that sets us free. 
On the other hand, you may attain it, and your patient may have improvement, but not complete healing. Because many factors come up that have to do not so much with you as the practitioner, but with them as patient. Sometimes they've been clinging to their condition for so long they can't release it. They just can't let it go. Even after you heal them of it, they, they'll bring it back. That happens. At other times, different reasons operate. Sometimes a person isn't really wholeheartedly uh, thinking of God or the kingdom of God, but with only an anxiety to get rid of this pain and no higher object than to get free right away so as to go out and be human again. And you don't always break through those uh, cases easily or quickly. Sometimes there's an absolute rebellion to truth inwardly, which you'll never know about. And uh, oh, there are so many different things that take place in the consciousness of a patient that makes it impossible for you to know why they do not respond because you've had the click, you've had the inner assurance that they're healed. If they are patient enough and you are patient enough, you'll eventually reach it and bring about their healing. And even then, it's strange that sometimes after you've done it, it may be a year or two later before they come back to tell you about it, and usually it's because something else has come up and they want more help. Although so many things happen because you must remember, the most fertile soil for healing is when we come to the place of indifference to the healing and uh, really feel it, it isn't that physical healing that I'm so much concerned about as it is experiencing and living and moving and have my being in the kingdom of God. And that is about the finest soil for healing. Well, you know how very few people will come to you at that point of readiness. Most of them come with, well, I've got rheumatism. Can't you do something about it? And... Uh, that's where you experience some difficulties. Now, the point is that you do not indulge judgment, criticism, or condemnation. You recognize that these states and stages of consciousness exist. You also recognize that you and I were that same way. So it doesn't behoove us to judge, criticize, or condemn anyone else. And so, with patience and persistence, we continue forward. Never hesitate to recognize error, but in recognizing its activity and nature, do not give it reality by believing that it exists as something real that has to be fought with or contended with. Recognize it for what it is, the appearance of the moment. Now... <clears throat> The reason that it is necessary for you to know both the correct letter of truth and to know why the correct letter of truth doesn't heal is this. There really is no truth that can be known with a human mind. Nothing that we know mentally, nothing that we read in a book, and nothing that we hear with our ears is really truth. For truth is God. And if we could read God in a book, we would be instantaneously lifted into complete harmony and wholeness. Everything that we read or hear or think upon or meditate upon, these represent our highest concepts of truth. They represent knowledge of truth, but not truth itself. Truth itself is never uttered by man, not any man. 
truth is uttered by God within the consciousness of man. And that is why this letter of truth is necessary so that you get free of all the accumulated uh, superstition and paganism of what is ordinarily called religion, things that lead, that, the teachings that are leading people to their doom. You have to get rid of those. You have to become free of those. And the only way you will is by coming to some awareness of the real nature of God so that you can also thereby know the nature of error and know it for its illusoriness, for the fact that it does not exist as reality, as absolute uh, essence or being. You have to know that in order that you can drop your fear of it. And in losing your fear of it, you can be still and let truth, God, utter itself to you. Now you will find that when truth utters itself to you within you, the earth melteth. He uttered his voice, the earth melteth. When God speaks in you, then you're back to where Jesus said, I of my own self can do nothing. The Father within me doeth the works. And then you will understand why it is that you and I are never healers. No matter how much truth we ever know, we are not really healers. Those are just courtesy titles. We are those who know that it is possible to receive direct impartations from God and that when we do, our world of error dissolves and disappears. We know that it is possible for God to speak. It doesn't have to be in conversation, you know. It doesn't have to be in audible language. can be, but it doesn't have to be. But we know that there can be direct impartation from God to man. And when direct impartation takes place, the earth, the earthly earth, melts. And then you find that this place that we're living in isn't earth at all. This is heaven. This is heaven seen through the eyes uh, that know two powers. That's what makes it earth. When you look out from a mind that has two powers, you behold a world that is sometimes beautiful, sometimes ugly, sometimes pure, sometimes sinful, sometimes rich, sometimes poor, sometimes at peace, sometimes at war. That's when you are looking out at this world through uh, the mind that knows two powers, good and evil. But when you rise, as you must rise in treatment, to a state of consciousness in which there are not two powers. There is neither good nor evil. There is only a divine presence, God. A divine being, God. A spiritual law, harmony. Now, when you look out, you'll find that you're no longer on earth, you no longer have good and evil. You no longer have sickness and health. You no longer have poverty and you no longer have wealth. You just have divine, harmonious being. You come then to a place where it makes no difference whether money is mounting up in the bank or in investments or whether your needs are just being met every day abundantly. Eventually, you will perceive that you'll always have 12 baskets full left over no matter how much you use, no matter how much you give, no matter how much you throw away, no matter what you do with it, there'll always be 12 baskets full left over. That may not be your experience in the very beginning. In the beginning, you may only be demonstrating that somehow or other, every need seems to be met. But very quickly you'll perceive that there's one basket full left over anyhow. 
And it will not be long until you'll see that there are 12 baskets full left over. No matter how generous you are, no matter how much you try to give away, it always comes right back plus an extra basket full. Now, this is not true in this world of two powers. It may seem to be true today. And then you wonder why it doesn't stay that way tomorrow or next year. So it is that every treatment that you give for yourself or another must not be concluded until you have arrived at a place of one power or of one law or of one life or of one something or other. And then you sit and wait for this little peace to be upon you and then you will see that fruitage will begin to appear in your experience and in the experience of those who come to you. The correct letter is necessary for two reasons. First, for yourself, since you will not come to this consciousness of the spirit while you're entertaining two powers in your thought, or while you're waiting for some unknown God to come to your rescue, you must know the correct letter. And then for the second reason, those who come to you for help. If you leave them, consciously or unconsciously, under the impression that there is some God somewhere going to do something, you leave them worse off than they were before. Because then, even if they have a blessing, they don't know how it happened. And uh, they just think that you have been... Uh, sought out and favored by God and if they can just rush to you why of course God will do it through you and not through them and you leave them worse off than they were before whereas if you start right from the beginning even in the simple way of the 23rd Psalm and say look the Lord is your shepherd now give up your fear you have nothing to fear for God is your shepherd God is leading you at least you are bringing them in a simple way to one power and uh, the constant recognition of that power. Do you see that? So you must have the correct letter for yourself because your treatment will not be effective until you've brought yourself to a state of consciousness that knows only one power. And then you must know it because you have to lead those who come to you gently at first up to the place of realization that there really is only one power and God is that. You see, it's at this stage of your career where you begin to understand that God will not do something for you an hour from now that God wasn't doing for you an hour ago. It may be that an hour for, from now you will become aware of what God has been doing for, for you from the beginning of time. But don't think that there's ever a point or a time when God enters uh, your experience to heal you this minute or next minute or supply you. What God has been doing, God has been doing forever. It is very much like the blind man opening his eyes and finding sunshine. And, of course, in his ignorance, he may believe that the sunshine was just created for him at that moment. And then you would say, oh, no, I have been seeing it there every single day of my life. And so it is. Those who have attained spiritual wisdom know that God is omnipresence, omnipotence, omniscience. God is the only life in this room, the only law. God is immortality and eternality expressed individually as each one of us. But you may have to awaken to that tomorrow. But remember, when you do, it was true yesterday. And then you start wondering why you hadn't awakened beforehand. So it is. 